My name is David, I'm one of the pastors here, and um, we're starting a new series called Margins. And I wonder if you could help me out. We're gonna just play a quick game. Um, would, you, would you finish the following sentence with me? I know I'm in a hurry when... When you forget things. That's good, that's good. When you're tailgating people. Thank you for being honest. This is where we're going. This is good. This is good. When I'm late. When you're late. So you're just late and feeling rushed. Yes, yes. I know I'm in a hurry when. Sorry, one second. You, sorry. Whenever, you leave, whenever I leave the house with two, two different shoes. Two different shoes. Okay. My son is always two different socks, but never two different shoes. That's fantastic. When church has already started, anyone, anyone? So, fantastic, thanks for that, Jen. When you can't read your own writing. When you can't read your own writing, oh man, I'm guilty of that. Actually, even when I'm not in here, I can't read my own writing. <clears throat> That's good, thank you. Anybody, anybody go and you're in line at a grocery store, or you're about to get in line at a grocery store, and you go through the process of counting the people in each lane? And you're like, okay, which lane is going fast? Oh, that person on the till looks quick today. <laughs> and then you get in a lane, and then do you ever actually adjust and go to a different lane once you're already in a lane? How many people are this bad that after you go through the process, you've actually kept track and it's like, did I win or did I lose when it comes? Because sometimes the lane you left actually goes faster. Is anybody that bad? Anybody else? I know I'm in a hurry when. The panic starts setting in. The panic starts setting in. Okay, this is real. This is real, yes, right? When your laptop sucks. When your laptop sucks and you didn't plug it in. Yes, there we go, right? When I forget my coffee. When you forget your coffee, <laughs> then the rest of the day, right? Right? Thanks, Bill. Last one. When you're impatient or grumpy, because it, like truly, this is, this is where this goes. This hurried life is not always helpful because it gets beyond just, just traffic or grocery lanes, right? It actually starts to impact us when we experience this sense of hurry, this sense of feeling rushed. So there was a study done with like 20,000 Christians from across the globe. It was called the Obstacles to Growth Survey. And busyness was identified as a major distraction in spiritual growth. Busyness. So Michael, Michael Ziccarelli, the one who conducted the survey, his hypothesis was this. It may be the case that, one, Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, which leads to, two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to, three, a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to, four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to, five, more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload, and then the cycle begins again. This gets a little bit more unhelpful as we kind of stay in this environment, in, if we stay in this hurried state. Corey Tenboom says this. She said, the, the devil, if he can't make you sin, he'll make you busy, which sometimes has a similar effect. John Mark Comer wrote a brilliant book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and we're going to be referring back to it over the next few weeks. In his book, he says, hurry is a state of frantic effort one falls into in response to an adequacy, fear, and guilt. The simple essence of hurry is too much to do. The problem isn't that you have a lot to do. The problem is that you have too much to do. And only one way to keep up the quota is to hurry. Now, as much as this flies in the face of our culture, fast is not always better. For me to be present in the moment, it requires times where I slow down long enough 
to just absorb and experience what's happening around me, right? A few different authors write, the the slow is the speed of love. Love, joy, and peace are at the heart of what Jesus is trying to grow in your life, and all three are incompatible with hurry. John Ortberg writes, "I, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. Walter Adams was the spiritual director to C.S. Lewis, which is crazy to me. To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. So let's be clear. This is not about not being productive and getting stuff done. This is not about laziness. That's not what we're talking about. This is about breathing room. Andy Stanley says breathing room is the space between our current pace and our limits. Is there margin between the pace that we're traveling at and the limits or the capacity that we have? Now, John Mark Comer gives another list, and in fact, he he references in his book something he calls hurry sickness. In a state, in a society where we are just running and just amped up. He talks about like, what does that lead to? Where does that bring us? What's what's the implications of that? And there are some things, and don't put your hand up for the answer to these questions, but there's 10 symptoms that he's come up with for hurry sickness. And we're just gonna go through them. And again, don't don't raise your hand, but just in your own mind, what what does this look like? What are the symptoms that you have, or, or if you have hurry sickness? Number one, irritability. You get annoyed just way too fast. Hypersensitivity, it just, it just takes a minor comment to hurt your feelings. Now, normally it doesn't, but when you're in hurry mode, sometimes you're just a little bit more sensitive than, than not. Restlessness, even when you slow down to rest, you find it actually just hard to relax. Anybody? You have a day off and you're just like, I don't know if this is enough. There's something just missing. I'm, I'm feeling as though it's hard for me to just slow down and experience rest. Workaholism, nonstop activity, your drugs of choice are accomplishment and accumulation and it just drives you. You're like, I need to stay in the mode of continuing and getting more and doing more and accomplishing more. Emotional numbness. Sometimes you just don't have the capacity to feel another person's pain or even your own pain. Out of order priorities. You feel des- disconnected from your own sense of identity or calling. So you're kind of going through the motions, but you ask yourself kind of like, why am I going through the motions? Is this actually what I'm designed to do? Number six, out of order seven, pardon me, lack of care for your body. You don't have time for just the basics of a good night's sleep and exercise. And, and a healthy meal or just a, regum- a, a regimen of like regular eating habits. Number eight, escapist behaviors. We choose our distraction of choice and we just try to pull back. That might be overeating or over drinking or binging Netflix. It's just like, I need something to distract me from the world in which I live because I'm just not coping well. Microsoft conducted a study. This is fascinating. They conducted a study and they asked, when nothing is occupying my time, I reach for my phone. I think the number is probably higher now, but at this time of the survey, it was 77%. Said, when there's, when there's nothing really I have to do, where do I go? I, I go to my phone. There's a place where we've kind of lost that sense of margin because as soon as we have a space, we want to fill it. Slippage of spiritual disciplines. When you're over busy, often the first first things to go are the things that are life-giving versus life-draining for your soul. Practices, spiritual practices, they take some effort, and if we're tired, we're not willing to do the effort. You know what I mean? When our kids were small, we would take our kids hiking, and, and we weren't the hiking family all the time, but whenever we would take our kids hiking, they would like never want to go hiking. I'm just gonna throw Levi under the bus for a second. Especially my youngest son. He would be like, I don't wanna go hiking, please. Anything but hiking. And then when we would actually go out to the mountains, we start a trail, the person who was leading us and saying, let's go, let's let's keep going, let's keep going. I can't wait to do more of this. Why don't we do more of this? Dad, mom, seriously, why are we not hiking more often? It was fascinating. It was hard to get him going, but once he got going, man, he just loved being outdoors and specifically hiking. 
And spiritual disciplines is a little bit like that. Once you actually kick into it, once you actually start doing it, all of a sudden your life changes, but sometimes you don't have the energy to actually just start the process. Number 10, you feel disconnected from God, others, and your own soul. So don't put your hand up, but how did you do? And, and this is not a shame or guilt moment. This is just a, a, a bit of a, we just want to start this moment by identifying what is the problem and is it actually real? And, and I, I think it is. I think all of us have this moment where we find ourselves going, I'm just always in a hurry. I feel as though I'm just kind of constantly in movement and I'm not taking time to pause and be present. So if this is the state we're in, how do we live differently? And the brilliant thing is, is there is a solution to this. In fact, there's a really good solution to this. We practice the way of Jesus. Because as busy as Jesus was, and he literally just did things like change the world. So he had a couple things on his plate, right? But as busy as he was, he didn't live a hurried life. And so let's just unpack a little bit. How is it that Jesus did this? And also, we're going to just start with like, what does it look like to take on the practices or the way of Jesus? Now, in Jewish culture, rabbis had something called a yoke. That's just what they referred to it. It was kind of the way in which they navigated life, right? And so a rabbi would pass on to an apprentice a way of life or a yoke. And if you can think for a moment, if, you, if you've seen pictures of an oxen, two oxen beside each other with a wooden carved yoke that kind of brings them together, right? And so what the yoke does is it helps both animals to walk in step. So instead of one pushing and dragging, it's amazing how much more two oxen, when they're pulling in the same direction at the same rhythm, they can pull way more than just two times the weight. It's actually quite remarkable. When there's two oxen pulling in weight, it's amazing how much they can actually get done together. So a rabbi would have apprentices, and an apprentice would come along, and the rabbi would say, I want to show you the way in which I live. And this is not just a theoretical exercise. This is the way in which I live. In fact, I want you to model your life after the way I am living. I want you to apprentice under me. I want you to follow me. Now, Jesus had a yoke. And as a rabbi, it's not surprising that he had a yoke. He describes it in Matthew chapter 11. He says this in verse 28. Come, come to me. All you who are struggling hard and carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble, and you will find rest for yourselves. My yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. So as a rabbi, Jesus invites the apprentice in, and he says, would you would you walk with me? I love how Eugene Peterson describes the exact same passage. He says, are you tired? Are you just worn out? Do you feel hurried? Are you burned out on religion? Come, come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. That's not what I'm going to do to you. Instead, keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. As we talk about being hurried, are you experiencing a sense of just like, I'm tired? In fact, I might even call it burnout. Jesus' invitation is come to me or apprentice under me. As a rabbi, it's not a surprise again that Jesus had a yoke, but it is a surprise that Jesus describes it as easy. That's not what most apprentices found at this time. It was a lot of hard work. If you're going to be apprentice, you've got you to get your, your stuff together, right? But Jesus says, no, 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 apprentice with me, and you're going to find that it's not ill-fitting. 
you're going to find that you're going to walk in the unforced rhythms of grace. Keep company with me and you'll learn to walk freely. Now, in our culture, burnout is not limited to a stockbroker on Wall Street, right? It's just more prevalent than that. And Jesus offers a better way. And that's what the good news is. For the next four weeks, we're going to just like, well, what is this way? Now, if you're new to church and you're wondering what this looks like, it's as simple as walking in step with Jesus. It's learning how he did something and saying, can I just copy that? Yeah. He invites you to. In fact, he says, would you walk in step with me so that together we could be, we could be like, to, like two oxen pulling in the same direction? Now, some of you are like, okay, can I just call time out for a second? I grew up in church. I call myself a Christian, and sometimes I still experience burnout. In fact, that might be even where I am right now. So what's up with that? Why is it that Jesus says the, the burden is light, and yet when I follow him, or when I try to follow him, or when I'm trying to do whatever it is that I'm supposed to do as a, as a follower of Jesus, I'm still experiencing some burnout? Dallas Willard, Referring to Matthew 11, this is so important. Referring to Matthew 11, he says, the secret of the easy yoke. In this truth lies the secret of the easy yoke. The secret involves living as Jesus lived in the entirety of his life, adopting his overall lifestyle. If you want to experience the life of Jesus, you must adopt the lifestyle of Jesus. Okay, so thanks, Pastor. So what you're telling me is, just be Jesus. That's helpful. If we want to, the solution to an unhurried life full of the presence and purpose, it's, it's just basically like, so just, so just forget what I'm doing and be Jesus. But, but, but before we dismiss this too quick, Jesus said his yoke was easy. So are you telling me that this is doable or is this completely impossible? Jesus seems to think it's doable. The way of Jesus is a way of life. So this, if you grew up in church, this, this was profound to me. Again, The Elimination of Hurry from John Mark Comer is a helpful book. The way of Jesus is a way of life, not just a set of ideas or theology or a list of do's or don'ts or ethics. It is something more than that. It is engaging in a lifestyle, not simply intellectually engaging with a conversation or agreeing with his theology. Eugene Peterson says this, the way wedded, to, the Jesus way wedded to the Jesus truth brings about the Jesus life. This is too important not to say again. The Jesus way wedded with the Jesus truth helps us engage in the Jesus life. But Jesus as the truth gets far more attention than Jesus as the way. Jesus as the way, this is Eugene Peterson, is the most frequently evaded metaphor among the Christians with whom I have worked for the past 50 years as a North American pastor. The solution is simpler than we think. If we want to experience the life to the full of Jesus, his nonstop conscious enjoyment of God's presence, all we have to do is to adopt not only his, his theology and ethic, but also his lifestyle. Jesus offers his apprentices a whole new way, a whole new way to handle the real pressures of life. An easy life isn't an option, but an easy yoke is. We can learn the rhythms of Jesus and follow him. His life rhythms have come to be known as spiritual disciplines. Now, if that sounds really religious to you, use the word practices or habits. Jesus had some things in the way in which he conducted his life that he kept going back to over and over and over again. He continued to practice them over and over and over again. And it's the way of Jesus that brings freedom from a hurried lifestyle. He still got stuff done, but while he was engaging in what God had called him to do, he did practices or habits all throughout the process. And if we can understand what those habits and practices are, and not just hear about them, but step into them, our lives will be changed. 
We will follow in, in line with the way of Jesus. It is like two oxen, and we will say, Rabbi, teach me your ways, and I want to walk with you, harnessed together through a yoke, and I want to experience the freedom that you walked in because somehow you lived a life of accomplishment, but you didn't get weighed down by the hurried and, and busyness and sense of meaninglessness that was around you. How did you do it? Now, we're going to walk through the next four weeks the practices or the habits, some of the practices or habits of Jesus. Today we're gonna to take a moment and we're gonna talk about silence and solitude. Now please don't turn your brain off and go, okay, now we're having a conversation about spiritual bis- disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are boring. Um, I'm gonna wait until the service is over and go have some lunch. Can you stay with me for a minute? Can we just kinda of go like, what if we could practice the very habits that Jesus practiced? If we want to pattern our lives after Jesus, we must learn to follow him into a quiet place for seasons of silence and solitude. I went ahead in my notes. Can we back up one second? By following the practices or habits of Jesus, we can pattern our lives after him. Step one, what does it look like to pattern our lives after Jesus? We simply follow his practices or habits. A discipline is something that you can accomplish by direct effort to affect your ability to do something you can't accomplish by direct effort. If you're going to train for a marathon, it's not advisable to start day one with going 26 miles. That's just not helpful. But you can do it, just not yet. So you do something that you can do for the purpose of eventually getting to a place where you can do something that you couldn't do, but now you can do. It's a discipline. The thing that's different about spiritual disciplines is that you're not only accessing your own capacity or willpower, but you're actually, you're making room for the Holy Spirit to come in and indwell in you and actually be part of the transformation process. He wants to enable you to step into things that are currently beyond your capacity. Even the thought of saying, you can live like Jesus. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is saying? Yes, you can. I've seen it before, and I'll help you do it. The habits of Jesus are real things that make their way into your real schedule. Following Jesus is something you do, a practice as much as a belief. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be, again, talking about the practices of Jesus. So, As we engage in this conversation about silence and solitude, I want us to just take a moment and actually see how did this work out in Jesus' life? Like, can we actually look at some examples? Yes, we can. So take a look at Mark chapter one, and we see an example of how this showed up in Jesus' life. In Mark one, Jesus had finished a busy day of ministering to lots of people. This is the day Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. So he's he's busy doing ministry, and then we get to verse 32. That evening at sunset, people brought to Jesus those who were sick or demon-possessed. The whole town gathered near the door. He healed many who were sick with all kinds of diseases, and he threw out many demons. So basically, the town shows up to the door, and Jesus is involved in pouring out emotionally, spiritually, physically. He's engaging with people. It's a long day, right? Early in the morning, well before sunrise, Jesus rose and went to a deserted place where he could be alone in prayer. There are so many examples of this in the four biographies or or gospels that we have in the New Testament. Jesus consistently found a deserted or quiet place to pray. Was he busy? Yes, he was busy. He just healed half the town. But the next morning he got up and he said, where is a quiet place? His time in the quiet place influenced how he engaged with other people. He got strength from the quiet place, not the place itself, but the God who met him there. So he already had, so he, 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 he's changed in the quiet place and then it transforms him and it actually influences his interaction with other people as he's engaging in that space. Verse 36, as we continue in the same story, Simon and those with him tracked him down. They were looking for him. When they found him, finally, they told him, everyone is looking for you. You're like really popular right now. This is what we wanted. Everybody wants to talk to you. Isn't this what we, this is what we wanted. Jesus, we're ready to go. 
We've got now like a whole, a whole plan laid out for you. Your itinerary is set. And in a very unhurried fashion, Jesus responds differently. Let's head in the other direction to the nearby villages so that I can preach there too. That's why I have come. So there's people around Jesus that are saying, this is what you need to do now. This is what a life of what you do looks like. So Jesus, you need to step into it now. Now is the time, go for it. And sometimes we have other people that are saying to us, now is, this is what opportunity, this is what success looks like. And sometimes we just need to say, hang on a minute, what have I heard from God in the quiet place? Because I don't think the trappings of a hurried life is what I wanna run after. What I wanna run after is the way of Jesus. At least that's what he did. And I wanna walk in step with him as much as I know how. In Mark 6, <clears throat> One more example, Jesus sends his disciples to go out and tell people about him and heal the sick. So this is the moment where he says, okay, disciples, I've been pouring into your life, now it's time for you to go. Go change the world. P proclaim the good news and heal the sick and even cast out demons. They were just like, go for it. And they come back with stories to tell. And not only is, which would have been just like, ministering to people and they would have been physically and emotionally tired. Not only that, but they also find out at that moment that John the Baptist has been killed. It's terrible. They are physically and emotionally just wiped out. They are drained in this moment. Starting in verse 30, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him everything that they had done and taught. Many people were coming and going, so there was no time to eat, so they're hungry on top of it. He said to the apostles, come by yourself to a secluded place and rest for a while. They departed by a boat by themselves for a deserted place. So Jesus said, you know what? You see me do it, now I want you to do it. Come to a deserted place. You need to rest for a while. Tired and hungry, Jesus says to his apprentices, come to a quiet place and I will be there with you and you will experience rest. You know what it's like to have time off or, or, or you look at there's a gap in your schedule and you do something and at the end of that experience, you're like, I don't feel refreshed. Anyone, there's days where I've just been wrestling and ask myself, like, what does renewal actually look like? What, what do I do that refreshes me? And the nice thing about this is Jesus actually has something to offer this conversation. It's not just a date night and a movie. Like sometimes that can be refreshed. I'm not, I'm, I love going to movies. But, but there's something about asking us ourselves, like what actually brings re refreshment and renewal and rest to my soul? And Jesus had something to offer. In fact, I think he says, man, if when you get away with me to the quiet place, you can experience that. Now, like you often experience and like I often experience, sometimes life happens, right? And sometimes things come up. Sometimes the kids just go like they're kids and you don't have the time to rest like you thought you did. Sometimes there's an emergency at work, right? There's just things that come up and it's like, wait a minute, I, I, I had some time set aside for rest and, and it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. And that's real life. And it was real life for Jesus too. For him, it wasn't an emergency at work. It was the crowds that followed him and his disciples as they went away to kind of find a place for rest. The crowds followed, not just a couple, not just a dozen, thousands of them and that the intended rest got delayed. And so what Jesus did is he, is he, he stepped into that moment and he, and he taught. And he, and he ended up actually engaging with, with the help of a little boy's lunch. He ended up engaging in feeding thousands of people. Wrap your mind around that. So with his disciples handing out food, he, just, he, did, he did some more work is what he did. And then after that was over, Verse 45, right then Jesus made his disciples get into a boat and go ahead to the other side of the lake towards Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After saying goodbye to them, Jesus went up onto a mountain to pray. After the teaching, after the meal, Jesus sends his followers off to cross the lake and he finds a quiet place. 
Again, there's so many examples of him doing this. In the quiet place, we can find practice and solitude. So we're going to just take a moment and just touch base quickly on, on each of these things. Silence and solitude in the quiet place. What does that look like? So silence, we can think about external silence. Turning off the noise. What does that look like to just, for a moment, turn off the noise? Now, it can be as simple as turning the radio off for a minute or taking your headphones out just for a minute, right? And just say, do you know what? I'm just going to turn off the noise. And I'm going to experience quiet for a moment. And instead of just reaching my phone and filling that margin, I'm just going to stop for a moment. I'm going to let that margin sit for a minute. I'm going to say, Jesus, can I meet you in the margin? Can I just meet you for a moment in a quiet place? My, uh, my wife years ago went on a, on a silent retreat it doesn't have to be any that, anything that extreme, but that was a profound experience for her. Part frustrating, but also part re rewarding. Our house was anything like a silent retreat, believe me. So for her to get away and just have some time. But it, again, it doesn't have to be that extreme. It, it can just be like turning the volume down. But then there's internal silence, right? The mental chatter that doesn't stop. The conversations that you play over and over again. All those things, the, the frustrations, the, the, the sense of hurry, the, all the things that, that occupy our mind, the worry, the what if, it's easy to turn the volume off of your phone, but, but the internal noise is harder to shut off. But silence, the sense of like what it looks like to experience silence in that moment, this is, this is a practice of trying to turn down both. How do we turn down the external and the internal noise and experience silence? Solitude, that I, I love the description from renovare.org on solitude, an open relational space for being found by God and freed from competing loyalties. Isn't that just fantastic? Like, does God have to compete with my schedule or can I just make room for him in it? And can I just say, God, I, I, this is a space that there's, there's no other competition. Not isolation or loneliness, pardon me, Solitude is not isolation or loneliness. That's not what, it's different than that. It's not withdrawing from people and never talking to them again. Solitude is a matter of actually, as Richard Foster describes, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. Now, let's kind of wrap this up. What is this actually, like, what's the application here? How do we actually step into this? And I just, I love that Jesus practiced solitude and silence on days when he was actually busy and he got a lot of stuff done. The busier, as a matter of fact, the busier he got, the more he practiced. On one day, he healed a good percentage of the town. He, on another day, he fed over 5,000 people. These are the days he went and found a quiet place. How did Jesus live a full yet unhurried life? Consistently, he, it was a habit of his, a practice, a discipline. He said, I'm going to find a quiet place. So I would encourage you to just, just it, 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 it seems, well, it can't be that easy, but maybe it is. Find a walking trail, a park down the street, a, a reading nook in your home, or a, or a morning routine before the kids wake up. Where is a space where you can just like pause for a minute and be silent with Jesus? Slow down, breathe, listen. Now, I've got to confess, when I slow down, it, it takes a minute to experience silence. It doesn't happen automatically, especially if I haven't done it for a while. The whirlwind of thoughts and concerns, they keep spinning in my head and it's like, wait a minute, I've, uh, this is not inner silence. My mind is going crazy right now. But all those things, it's good for them to come out, right? It's good for them to come out with Jesus. And we can share our concerns and we can take our concerns to him and we can be honest and vulnerable and open. In fact, in those spaces, I find Jesus <laughs> encourages me to be honest. He doesn't ask me to cover stuff up. He says, in fact, in fact, he says, he encourages a sense for me of probably being more honest than I'm willing to be. So he says, no, no, in that quiet place, I want those concerns. I want to hear your heart. And then it, and then it comes. There's, there's some quiet, there's some silence, and God speaks with love over his sons and daughters. He speaks purpose and calling. Really quick story. Back in February 
2020. Um, I was on my kind of my regular routine of the quiet place walk that I often walk. February 2020 was a month before COVID and three months before Pastor Dave Spate resigned. And can I just tell you, in my quiet space, I have this written down on my phone. February 1st. Jesus says to me in my quiet place, David, something's coming and it's going to take some courage. Are you up for it? That might sound really casual to you. We have no idea how many times I've looked back on that moment and that prayer more than anything I have read or heard or listened to in the last four years, that moment has been helpful for me. Because in the quiet place, Jesus whispers calling and purpose to a point where our yoke actually gets a little bit lighter. And he says to us, I, I'm in this with you. Now, as I prepared for this talk, and, and even honestly, before I did a bunch of reading for this talk, I, just, I, I asked Jesus, is there anything that you have to say, that you want to say? Of course you have things to say. Is there anything you specifically want to say this morning? And I, and I just heard Jesus say, I, I want to invite you, or I want, I want to ask you to invite my people to walk with me. And that's not some spiritually figurative metaphor thing. It's like, would, would you go for a walk with me? Would you find a quiet place? Would you just simply invite me into that space? Because I can't wait to meet you there. And it's not hard. You don't even have to practice. You just need to step into it and engage in the practice of Jesus. I want to invite the worship team to come up if they could, and um, we're going to have a moment to just focus our attention on Jesus, but, but church, this is an opportunity. He's inviting us into a space where we just say, we want to come to you, Father. We want to experience you in the quiet place. So Jesus, I, I thank you for this morning. I thank you. We've just sensed your presence from the start, and I know you're bigger than all that but I thank you that you are committed to walk with us and teach us and guide us. And this morning I ask that you would, uh, with the gentleness and sensitivity that you have, open our spirits up to receive from you. And that there would be dozens, even hundreds of people that would take you on your invitation and simply go for a walk and hold your hand and let you speak to us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.